Now I'd like to welcome um, Jess, Pat and Frank. They're going to talk about a great community project, Living Banyada. Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to present at this wonderful forum. It's really delightful to be here and I'd really love to pay my respects to the um, Gunai Kurnai people, the elders of, of this country that we're meeting on and also the elders of the Lake Tyres Aboriginal Trust that we've been working with uh, in this project. Um, I'm standing here with the Brain Trust, um, Dr. Pat Bonney, who's just recently completed his PhD in uh, citizen science and the disconnect between um, policy and practice. And also Frank Flynn, who is a longtime teacher and a passionate Gravilla enthusiast. Um, and you'll also hear, be hearing from Hillary, uh, also part of our Living Bunyanda project after we speak. And whilst this project is not strictly about bushfire recovery, it's not what it was set up for, just having this project give, gave the opportunity to the community to come together and speak about their experience of, of living through the bushfire. And whilst the major towns of Lake Tyres were not directly impacted in terms that, that they weren't burnt, certainly the catchment was people were evacuated, everyone smelt the smoke, so uh, they were impacted in other ways. So what is Living Bunyanda? The idea for this project came from the Stories of Influence, um, which is a, a gathering to, to talk about storytelling that happened back in Now Now in 2017. And Wayne Thorpe spoke about his stories of Bunyanda or Lake Tyres, and particularly about the natural openings of the sand berm that separates Lake Tyres from the sea. And he was really concerned about making sure that we wait for the natural cues for the berm to open. Um, and although the Lake Tyres is part of the Gippsland Lakes Ramsar listing, uh, it's in a much better condition than the other lakes to the west. And so it tends to get left out a little bit. It's, it's um, you know, considered to be pristine and lovely, so it doesn't get as much attention that the other lakes do. So we saw this as a bit of an opportunity for the community to look after their lake. But first of all, we wanted to know what people's concerns and interests were. So we did some mapping of, you know, what, what are the patches that people knew? They've got people living right throughout this catchment or certainly throughout the lake. What did they care about? What were they concerned about? What things that they want to share with the, with the broader community and with management authorities as well? So how did they want to be heard and how did they want to speak for and be the voice of the lake? So how does it actually work? Um, after the original mapping that we did, we, we found that um, the community felt or a lot of people in the community felt that they had a lived experience and a knowledge of this place that they're deeply connected to, but they didn't have the evidence to be able to prove their case. So we thought, all right, you want science? We'll give you science. So we did some citizen science training and a range of different methods, including water quality, vegetation monitoring, bird monitoring. Uh, there was a biodiversity survey that was undertaken at the Bluff, which is due for a, a fuel reduction burn next week. Um, and we also have put some platforms up for ways to, for the community to be able to share these ideas. So be able to explore what's already out there through Nature Kit, to add their observations through iNaturalist and also uh, switch into some citizen science programs that are already existing. I'll switch over Sweet. to Pat. So the science is just one way in which we're interested in by Yander is engaging with communities so they can get to know their local areas. But um, you know, and I think we'd all agree that science is going to be an important part of bushfire recovery. But Living Banyanda is also underpinned by an appreciation that science is not the only way that we can understand the world that we live in. Um, we're also providing space for other forms of knowledge, and these include local history and, and observations of environmental change, uh, traditional knowledge and, and, and stories of lake tyres, um, and also art and photography um, uh, from a pretty active artist community around the area. And so we know we know that this knowledge is not necessarily, you know, going to meet strict scientific criteria or be um, open to, to standardization. But I think we think that, you know, if we if we ignore this alternative forms of knowledge and um, if we or if we give it a lower status than science, uh, we risk shutting the door on you know, innovative ways that communities and governments can more deeply understand environmental change and also respond uh, to it. So, and so the last thing we want is for all this information being collected to just sort of sit on a shelf and not to be used. And so, and we, the other thing we don't want is for Living Banyanda to be, you know, simply uh, a feel good community engagement exercise. So the question is for us, you know, how can we better use this knowledge uh, to, um, that comes from the community, that's held within the community? 
to inform environmental decision making that really does meet the, the challenges that, that's facing uh, the Lake Tyres community. And so Jess and I are being guided by a number of principles uh, to try and bridge this, you know, this apparent knowledge action gap. And so we're listening carefully to the voices of experience, uh, be they community members, traditional owners, policy makers. And you know what we're what we're hearing is that the community desperately wants to be involved in the decisions that affect them. We're providing resources and training opportunities to build skills in science and, and, and to you know raise people's confidence in conservation action as as just described. We're working to strengthen relationships between different sections of the community, but also between the community and government agencies as well. And importantly, Jess and I are not driving the process or just simply observing it. You know, where it's critical that Jess and I are, you know, not just researchers, but facilitators of this process. And um, over the course of the project, you know, we're constantly sort of evaluating and refining. And so for me, the Living Banyan is not necessarily a, a new idea. Similar projects are being set up across the world um, and where knowledge is, environmental knowledge is sort of jointly developed with a range of different people, but, that, but it's specific to the environmental challenges that are affecting a particular place. And, and these projects are important because research, research is showing us that where, when community takes the lead, they have high levels of capacity for dealing with disaster, dealing with environmental change. And so before I hand it over to Frank, um, Jess and I, you know, I do invite those who see value in Living Banyanda to join us, community members, scientists, traditional owners, um, government agencies, you know, to help us develop a vision for the future of Lake Tyres and its community. So take it away, Frank. <laughs> Um, as a participant in the, the Float Almanac process in 2017, I set out, people were talking about the lake, but I thought the catchment was the big thing. So I set out to map, because I really didn't know where, where the catchment borders were. Set out to map and record the floor of, of the lake tyres catchment, just a little bit bigger project than I could possibly do. But I was given Jeff Cook's um, mud map of uh, where Gravillia salata grew in the uh, Cahoon Forest Lake Tyres catchment by Tom Crooks actually. Um, so I set out to do that three journals later. Um, I, I managed I managed to sort of take, get all that done. Um, of course the area where that Gravillia grows has been severely burnt both by wildfire and by managed fire. And um, I think I've, I've, so my work is to try and keep a record of what's happened in those particular areas. But I've been living in this area. I grew up at NSA, ran away to Melbourne, but I've been back here for 20 odd years. I've taken a pretty keen interest in three other areas around here. Mount Elizabeth, the Tara Range, which was mentioned earlier, um, and the Lake Ties Berm. And I've got photographs from the last 20 years of those areas. And I've, I've got a, a record of, I'm pretty sure, photographic record of every opening of the uh, lake. So um, the, I've got ton, thousands and thousands of photos and tying into the Living Bunyanda, I see that as a project that will encourage me to um, sort of put my stuff together and look at it and say, this is important. And just like Jeff Cook's maps, because he did so much research of his own of where Gravilla Salada grew, um, that I'll have a sort of a record of stuff that people might be able to use in the future. And through Living Banyanda, we can just build up data that's there. It might not be, as just said, might not be scientifically uh, valid, but it's all observation. And if you tie it together with all the other observation, it just allows us one more thing to work with. Thank you. What's that? Yep, one more. <laughs> 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 I depressed it earlier. Thank you, Jess, Pat, and Frank. And um, it's just lovely to see science and art and photography all uh, expressed in a way that is meaningful and uh, as part of that there we've got an art table so if you feel in the break we've got breaks coming up so if you feel in the break you'd like to express yourself please feel free to do so
I don't think I will add my uh, creative flair over there because it's not great. But uh, for those that want to, more than welcome. <laughs>